Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Hay reporting from Southern India. I'd like to do a video now on Bertrand Russell's The Problems of Philosophy, a great example of analytic philosophy and uh, a book where Russell basically tries to answer the question, well, what is philosophy anyway? Now, the reason I reread this was I'm currently writing about it in my own upcoming book, Hermeneutical Death, Technological Destruction of Subjectivity, a very long book I project to be over 700 pages, kind of my big work of original philosophy um, which uh, should be available in sometime maybe like August of this year. Now, the reason I went back to Russell was because he examined how does philosophy differ from the other sciences. Well, they all aim at knowledge, but the difference is that if you take a scientist, let's just say uh, somebody from the chemistry department on campus, um, or you take a mathematician, even a historian, and you ask them the question, what truths have been made certain in your field? Uh, that person will pretty much talk as long as you're willing to listen, because there is no shortage of things that they've made certain. Um, they've linearly piled, uh, linearly piled up a huge number of truths within all of those fields. But if you take a philosopher and ask the same thing, that person will basically confess to you that that list is pretty much empty. Um, but there is a very specific reason for this. And that is that Russell says, as soon as definite knowledge concerning any subject becomes possible, that subject ceases to be philosophy and it simply becomes a separate science. So the study of the heavens used to be philosophy. Um, not only say, Isaac Newton considered himself to be a natural philosopher, but um, you go back further to like Thomas Aquinas uh, trying to do a study of the entire universe, but as an Aristotelian Catholic medieval philosopher. He's studying the same object, but he's using unclear terminology like, well, you know, the substance and es essence and category um, and, and being is another unclear term. But when you had uh, the clear terminology about the universe, it simply became astronomy, which is to say it became physics. And then it was no longer philosophy, but that was precisely because it had become perfectly clear how to proceed that you were able to start progress. You were able to start just building up the list of uh, facts rather than running around in circles trying to determine, um, you know, the kind of metaphysical problems of medieval philosophy. And he said the same thing basically happened with the human mind. Um, that was part of philosophy when Descartes, for example, gave you the unclear terms to talk about, to talk about it. He had terms like the cogito and God, an innate idea. But when psychologists frame questions of the mind clearly with ter in terms of physical investigation of how the brain functions as a lump of flesh, it was no longer philosophy, now it was just neuroscience, and that is when it was able to make progress rather than running in circles. And Russell doesn't necessarily see this as a problem. He says that the value of philosophy is precisely its uncertainty, because without that uncertainty, a person will never actually break free from the ordinary stance of dogmatism and naivety, which uh, he or she will otherwise have. He or she will otherwise simply... Um, you know, hold the views of common sense, the views of his age or nation, the views which had grown up in his mind without the cooperation or consent of de deliberate reason. In other words, you can only think if you have uncertainty, unclarity, and um, therefore philosophy is not to be studied for the sake of definite answers to questions, but rather for the sake of the questions themselves. That's how Russell ends the book. But we'll go back now and look at how he reached this conclusion that philosophy basically can only exist if you don't have perfect clarity, or as Jacques Ellul would say in technological society, once you have this strict rationalization at a formal level, it becomes technology. That's basically what uh, Bertrand Russell is meaning to say without actually reaching that level of the conclusion himself. So we have to go back and say, well, what is philosophy anyway? Um, if you um, have an, a naive stance towards the world, you will not see the level of vagueness and confusion which clouds your stance towards 
questions. It's only actually if you study philosophy that you'll realize that this sort of confusion and vagueness is present even for people who are maybe quite intelligent and refined in other ways, but maybe have not realized from a properly philosophical level how this is is a, is a problem, even in ordinary thought. He said that if you even try to uh, tackle something as basic as a difference between appearance and reality, um, what things are versus what they seem to be. Although Kantian dualism is basically dead by this era, Russell, even as a scientific empiricist himself, basically acknowledges that the same table will appear to be different colors from different points of view. In other words, he does not accept appearance at face value to tell you what something really is. And he said, you can actually problematize this intentionally. You could just put on a pair of blue glasses. You can shine an artificially colored light, and therefore you change the color and therefore the appearance of the table without really changing what the table is. Therefore, it's a legitimate question to ask whether the table even has any colors really at all. In other words, placing complete confidence in the census is bound for disappointment, both with regard to the color of the table, but also the shape. That also shifts with different viewpoints. Likewise, he notes that if a real table can be known, it is not known immediately. What is known immediately is sense contents. These are things like colors, smells, um, the hardness, the roughness of the table. We are able to know these things immediately because we have the five senses, and that is because we have physical bodies and so forth. But the real table as such is not any one of these sense contents. It is something which is merely an inference from them. We um, can infer the existence of the table on the basis of these things, but the two are not one and the same. Crucially, however, we therefore must say that the table that we're really talking about is a physical object, and therefore part of the set of all physical objects called matter. So translated into clear terminology, if you ask the table exists, you're really asking whether matter exists. And this has been one of the problems of philosophy. There have been many philosophers, in fact, Russell claims the majority of them, who say matter in that sense does not exist. These are idealists who say only minds and ideas exist. In Berkeley, you have minds and ideas, and if there's no mind viewing an idea, it also ceases to exist. The only reason the world, as we know it, uh, doesn't disappear when we die is because the ultimate mind, God, is keeping them all in existence, is Berkeley's idea. Of course, far from simply accepting the sense data at face value, Russell shows us that science tells us that what the thing really is, is just a vast collection of electrical charges in violent motion, at least in Russell's era. The question um, precisely from an empiricist scientific perspective is that the table is not what these sense data tell you. Um, and with this revealed, it becomes a legitimate question whether it makes sense to talk about any such thing as matter existing, at least in the sense we usually mean it. And calling this into question similarly calls the existence of other people's minds into question, since the existence of their body on a material level was what we depended on to take for granted the existence of their minds as well. And for he says, what if nothing exists and our entire experience is just a dream? And of course, that was the basis of modern philosophy with Descartes writing an entire book, meditating basically on what if all of this is an illusion. Of course, after dwelling on Descartes for historical reasons, Russell accepts that it is rational to believe that sense data maybe are not the thing in itself, but they are signs of the existence of something independent of us and our perceptions. A sensation can cease quite easily. All you have to do is remove your hand from touching the table. You no longer have those um, tactile sensations of the table, but that does not in itself cause the table to stop existing. Sense contents are not the thing in itself, but they are signs of the thing. And regarding what the thing really is, physical science, at least in uh, Russell's time, said that all natural phenomena can be reduced to motions. Light and heat and sound are all due to wave motions, which travel from the body emitting them to the person who sees the light or feels the heat or hears the sound, as I quote him himself. This means that the sense contents 
are not properties of the thing as had traditionally been thought within like the metaphysics of the Middle Ages and Aristotle's time. Rather, he says, the only properties which science assigns to the thing are, say, its position in space, the power of motion, according to laws of motion, etc. So it really is the case that sense contents are not properties of the thing itself. And therefore, he says, it is sometimes said that light is a form of wave motion, but even that is misleading. For the light which we immediately see, which we know directly by means of our senses, is not a form of wave motion, but something rather different. It's something which we all know if we're not blind, though we cannot describe it to someone who is blind. So one difference between a wave motion as such and light is that we actually can describe what a wave motion is to a blind person who cannot actually see it. We just describe the kind of wave motion you would feel if you were traveling in a boat over water. Because that's accessible by the sense of touch, which that person has, he, he can more or less restore an understanding of what a wave motion is from a linguistic description of it. Light, on the other hand, is something that we can't actually describe to a blind person because there's no way to restore an idea of it through the sense of touch. This is something you also find with color. If there is a blind person, could you describe to them what blue looks like? You could not, although you yourself know exactly what blue is, but not on the basis of anything except the sense contents that you have access to because of the sense of sight. Therefore, what we really mean is more that the waves are the physical cause of these sensations of light than that the waves are themselves light. Because light itself is experienced only by those who are not blind, it is not exactly considered to be a real part of the world as it exists in itself independent of our senses. We could say the same thing of other sensations too. It's not only colors and sounds and so on that are absent from the scientific world of matter as such. It's also space as we get um, to, as we access it through the senses of sight or touch. So to say that space is not really a part of the world as it is in itself, it's not that controversial because there's a certain inconsistency even in the different ways we have of experiencing it through the senses. You can experience sense, uh, excuse me, you can experience uh, space through the sense of touch, but that is not the same space that you experience through the sense of sight. The uh, space of science, of course, is neutral as between touch and sight as a quarter. Thus, it cannot be either of these things. Therefore, we have to say that the real space, if it exists, is public, but the apparent space is private to the percipient on the basis of these senses. Just as the blind man cannot know certain things about the kind of space accessible by sight, we also cannot know the physical space as such but only the kinds that are accessible to our senses. At best, we can just know the properties of the relations which are needed to preserve the correspondence between, uh, with the sense data, but we cannot know the nature of the terms between which the relations themselves hold, as I quote him. Therefore, there are similar difficulties with regard to accepting time at face value. For example, because it takes about eight minutes for the sun's light to reach us. When we see the sun, we are actually seeing the past. We are seeing the sun eight minutes ago. In fact, even if the sun ceased to exist by the time we saw it, this would make no difference with regard to the sense contents as such, they would still be the same. This affords a fresh illustration of the necessity of distinguishing sense data from physical objects, as I quote them. Uh, but we cannot hope to be acquainted directly with the quality in the physical object which makes it look blue or red. Science tells us that this quality is a certain sort of wave motion. Um, but the wave motion must really be in physical space, with which we have no direct acquaintance. Therefore, at the very least, even though the colors we see are not direct properties of the thing in itself, perhaps one might argue the thing in itself still does have properties like the ones we see, only better. Maybe the color we see is similar to the real color. It's not the same as it, but, but it still has some color. In other words, the thing in itself has all the kinds of properties we would expect, but doubles them in a platonic sense. It's just higher than the kind we can access. And he says himself, although physical objects cannot, for the reasons we have been uh, considering, be exactly like sense data, they might be more or less uh, similar to it. Um, they might really have colors, etc. However, this view falls apart 
as sensible as it might sound when you consider that color is not a property emitted from the object directly, is rather something modified by the medium intervening between us and the object. Color depends upon the nature of the light waves that strike the eye, and the intervening air alters the color unless it is perfectly clear, and any strong reflection will alter it completely. This is the color we see is a result of the ray as it reaches the eye, and not simply a property of the object from which the ray comes, as we cannot say that the object really has any colors at all. Russell then goes on to examine the difference between knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. There are two sorts of knowledge, knowledge of things and knowledge of truths. Knowledge of things, when it is of the kind we call knowledge by acquaintance, is pretty uh, much simpler than the knowledge of truths and logically independent of them. Knowledge of things by description, on the contrary, always involves some knowledge of truths as its source and ground. So let's go ahead and take a look at this distinction. Knowledge by acquaintance is anything of which we are directly aware without the intermediary of any process of inference or on a logical level or knowledge of truths. Thus, in the presence of a table, I am directly acquainted with sense data, its color, shape, hardness, smoothness, etc. And my knowledge on, uh, of the table as a physical object, on the contrary, is not direct knowledge. We've seen that it is possibly said, without absurdity, to doubt whether there is a table at all. My knowledge of the table is of the kind which we call instead knowledge by description. The table is the physical object which causes the sense data, and this describes the table by means of those sense data. There is no state in the mind in which we are directly aware of a table. All of the knowledge of the table is really knowledge of truths, and the actual thing which is the table is not strictly speaking, known to us at all. The first and most obvious example of something known directly by acquaintance is sense contents. However, that's not everything. You also have memory as an example of something known by acquaintance. Memories come back to us directly. Then there's also acquaintance by introspection. When I see the sun, I am often aware of my seeing of the sun. Thus, my seeing of the sun is an object with which I have acquaintance. My desiring food is an object with which I have acquaintance as well. This kind of acquaintance might be called self-knowledge, or excuse me, self-consciousness as the source of all of our knowledge of mental things. It is, however, intrinsically misleading to call this self-consciousness, since that implies the self is a thing which can be directly known. In fact, it's questionable whether the self is a thing at all in the usual sense of that term. On closer inspection, it, sh it seems that self-consciousness is really just consciousness of particular thoughts and feelings. Even if you try to look into yourself, what you'll actually find is just some particular thought or feeling. You won't actually find the I who has it. Therefore, he says that you might break this down into the following distinctions. Acquaintance with the data of outer sense is simply sensation. Acquaintance with the data of inner sense, this includes thoughts, feelings, desires, that's introspection. Mysteriously, we also have acquaintance with universals. You have general ideas like whiteness, diversity, brotherhood. In fact, you can't even form a single complete sentence without using at least one word which stands for universal, because all verbs are universal. Therefore, conceiving is an awareness of universals, and a concept is simply a universal of which we are aware. Therefore, physical objects in other people's minds are examples of things that are not known by acquaintance but through description. A description is a phrase of the form a so-and-so or the so-and-so. If it starts with a, it's ambiguous. If it starts with the, it's definite. An object is known by description. If we know that there is one object and no more which has a certain property ascribed to it, you can write this in logical notation. You have, uh, there exists at, there, there is, is at least one um, with the quantifier, and then you have the property um, uh, to which th that uh, thing is assigned as well. Therefore, we have, when we, uh, the so-and-so exists formula, we mean that there is just one object which is that way. Even though they seem to be names, many common words, even proper names, are really just oftentimes descriptions. This is because the thought in the mind of the person using a proper name correctly can generally only be expressed explicitly if we replace the proper name by a description. Proof of the need to 
to distinguish acquaintance and description, if you have the following, we can talk about the most long-lived of men. That's a description which actually only involves universals. It must apply to some man, but we can make no judgment concerning this man which involved knowledge of him beyond what this description consisting of universals tells us. When, for example, we make a statement about Julius Caesar, it's plain that Julius Caesar himself is not what's before our mind, because we're not acquainted with him. We have in mind, instead, a description of Julius Caesar, and it often is something which, although it seems like a proper name, you have something like the man who was assassinated on the Ides of March, or the founder of the Roman Emperor. Actually, this is a description. Okay? Knowledge by description is therefore very important, because far from being lower than direct knowledge by acquaintance, it allows you to build a crucial bridge to pass beyond the limits of private experience, and to therefore access a whole range of other contents. The set of things we have experienced is actually small in comparison with the things we can have described to us. And therefore, um, similar to Husserl's arithmetic, uh, uh, philosophy of arithmetic from 1891, in which he says, the vast majority of numbers are accessible on symbolic grounds. We can have intuitive access to um, you know, collections of uh, numbers less than 10, we can recognize the number if we see three apples. Um, but the vast majority of numbers we actually access on symbolic grounds, and this is fine. Russell is basically saying the same thing in general about what description allows you to access. However, this can only work if we have reliable laws of inference to make these connections, and therefore you are presuming some logical system functions to allow you to do this. Now you have to talk about the laws of thought. For example, we can know, regardless of which truth we are dealing with, that anything implied by a true proposition is true, or whatever follows from a true proposition is true. The obviousness of this case seems trivial, except to the eye of the philosopher who recognizes this for what is in something that shows indubitable knowledge is in no way derived from objects of sense. The above principle, as he says, is merely one of a certain number of self-evident logical principles. Some, at least of these principles, must be granted before any argument or proof becomes possible. This is precisely what allows you to have uh, proof in any sense. Therefore, you have the traditional laws of thought, such as the law of identity. Whatever is, is. The law of contradiction. Nothing can both be and not be. So is the law of excluded middle. Everything must either be or not be. Logical principles are known to us and cannot be themselves proved by experience, since all proof presupposes them. Um, but when anything is known immediately, its existence is known by experience alone. When anything is proven to exist, on the other hand, without being known immediately, both experience and a priori principles must be required. However, not all a priori knowledge is logical. Ethics, in fact, is a priori. For example, judging that happiness is preferable to misery is a priori. The same could be said of preferring knowledge to ignorance or saying that goodwill is better than hatred. Such judgments must, in part at least, be immediate and a priori. This is in part because it is impossible to logically deduce what should be from what is. Okay? And um, therefore, pure mathematics is also a priori. For example, once you see one time that 2 plus 3 equals 4, you don't actually become more certain of that after seeing a second example or more. It's already as certain as it ever will be or ever can be. Nor is this unique to our world. Any possible world on any universe, 2 plus 2 would still equal 4. Therefore, we can say in relation to Kant that this is general knowledge, whereas experience is a particular knowledge. We do not know who the inhabitants of London 100 years from this time will be, but we do know that any two of them will make four. So we must ask how this measures up with. So Russell basically accepts that Kant's definition of the thing in itself is um, identical with what he calls the physical object, that is, it's the cause of your sensations. Where Russell disagrees with Kant is the question of whether a priori knowledge is about our minds. Although belief in the law of contradiction is indeed an example of a thought, the law of contradiction itself 
is not actually a thought. It is a fact concerning things in the world. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is also not a judgment about our thoughts themselves. It's about all actual or possible couples. No fact about the constitution of our minds could make it true that 2 and 2 are 4. Therefore, a priori knowledge is not about the constitution of our minds, as Kant argued. It's rather applicable to whatever the world might contain, both what is mental and what is non-mental. Therefore, a priori knowledge is about a certain type of entity, but these do not exist in the mental or in the physical world. In language, we can name these by the parts of speech which are not substantives. For example, we speak of qualities and relations. Um, you have a, a simple sentence like, I am in my room. That breaks down, obviously, to components of I and my room, which are things. But the status of the word in is much trickier. Does in exist in the way that I and my room do? It must be true, though, that we can think about and understand the word in, for if we could not, then we would not understand a sentence like, I am in my room, but of course we do understand that. Yet whereas Kant claimed that relations are the work of the mind, Russell argued that relations must be placed in a world. It's just a world which is neither mental nor physical, kind of like um, uh, Frege's uh, appeal to the third realm, right? Neither the mind as such, nor the physical object, but someplace else. Relations have a being which is different both from physical objects and from the mind's, from sense data as well. Language can actually help you break this down. You have proper names, for example, which stand for particulars. Other substantives, adjectives, prepositions, and verbs, however, stand for universals. Pronouns stand for particulars, but are ambiguous. It's only by context that you know which particular they stand for. So, because no sentence can be made up with at least, uh, without at least one word which denotes a universal, usually a verb, all truths involve universals, and all knowledge of truths involves acquaintance with universals. Therefore, a common mistake is to overemphasize adjectives and common nouns um, as expressing qualities or properties of single things. That's how we usually think of universals, as uh, properties of things. Uh, but that misses the point that prepositions and verbs are also universals, but they express relations between two or more things. Therefore, knowledge of universals by acquaintance includes colors, tactile sensations, and other sensible qualities. That's perfectly true. But you also have knowledge of relations, and the easiest to know is a relation that holds even between the different parts of a single complex sense datum. For example, even within that one, you have some parts that are to the left of other parts, which are to the right of them. Therefore, there is also a relation in time. Something is before something else. Something is after something else. Another relation which we can become acquainted with much the same way is resemblance. If I see simultaneously multiple shades of the color green, I can see that they resemble each other. All a priori knowledge deals exclusively with the relation of universals, he claims. For example, we saw in our early chapters that knowledge of physical objects, as opposed to sense data, is only obtained by inference. And the same applies to our knowledge of other people's minds or any other class of things of which no instance is known to us simply by acquaintance. Therefore, knowledge by acquaintance among particulars includes sense data and ourselves, but among universals it includes sensible qualities, relations of space and time, similarity, certain abstract logical universals, etc. Knowledge by description is derivative knowledge which means it always involves both acquaintance with something and knowledge of truths. Intuitive knowledge is immediate knowledge of truths. These truths are self-evident. There is, however, some ambiguity in how we speak of truth. Sense data, for example, are in themselves neither true nor false. A particular patch of color is not true or false. It simply exists. The kind of being which can be true or false is radically different from the kind of being of the things in the world, as we usually think of them. Another class of intuitive judgments, analogous to those of sense, and yet to think from them are judgments of memory. A memory, he says, of an object is accompanied by an image of the object, but the image cannot be what constitutes the memory as such. 
Um, this is easily seen by noticing that the image is in the present, whereas you are explicitly remembering something known to be in the past. However, we are certainly able to, to some extent, to compare our image with the objects remembered, uh, as I quote him, so that we often know within somewhat wide limits how far the image is accurate, but that would be impossible unless the object, as opposed to the image, were in some way before the mind. Thus, the essence of memory is not constituted by the image, but by having immediately before the mind an object which is recognized as past. We all know what the past is, in other words, yet it is still impossible to restore an understanding of what it is through description, just as you cannot tell a blind man what light is like just by describing it with language. Thus, there must be, as I quote him, some intuitive judgment of memory, and it is upon this, ultimately, that all of our knowledge of the past depends. Self-evidence, therefore, is not a property which is simply present. It occurs in degrees. Memories have diminishing self-evidence as they become remoter and fainter. The truths of logic and mathematics have, broadly speaking, less self-evidence as they become ever more complicated. Judgments of intrinsic ethical or aesthetic value are apt to have some self-evidence, but comparatively not very much. Hence, although it is true that truth and falsehood are properties of beliefs, their properties dependent upon the relations of the beliefs to other things, not of the belief itself. So you have to think in terms of relations. Relation involved in judging or believing must be taken to be a relation of several terms, not just two. When, for example, Otello believes that Desdemona loves Cassio, he doesn't have before his mind a single object, Desdemona's love for Cassio. Rather, what is called belief or judging is nothing but this relation of believing or judging, which relates a mind to several things other than itself. An act of belief or judgment is the occurrence between certain terms in some particular. In every judgment, there is a mind which judges. There are terms concerning which it judges. You call the mind the subject in the judgment, the remaining terms the objects. The subject and the object together are called the constituents of the judgment. Be observed that the relation of judging has what is called a sense or direction. Um, that it has to be in a certain order. Otello's judgment that Cassio loves Desdemona is not the same as his judgment that Desdemona loves Cassio, despite the fact these are the same constituents, but rather have a different order. Therefore, whenever a relation holds between two or more terms, it unites them into a complex whole. When an act of believing occurs, this is a complex in which believing is the uniting relation and the subjects and objects are arranged in a certain order by the sense of the relation of believing. The relation loving as it occurs in the act of believing is one of the objects itself. When the belief is true, there is another complex unity in which the relation which was one of the objects of the belief relates to the other objects. On the other hand, when belief is false, there is no such complex unity composed only of the objects of the belief. Thus, a belief is true when it corresponds to an associated complex and false when it does not correspond. Desdemona and Castillo are object terms and Loving is therefore the object relation. If there is a complex unity, Desdemona's love for Cassio, consisting of the object terms related by the object relation of the same order as they have in the belief, then this complex unity is called the fact, the cor corresponding to the belief. Thus, the belief is true when there is a corresponding fact, and false when there is none. There are many ways um, beyond logical, uh, besides logical inference, by which we might pass from one belief to another. Um, However, these psychological inference uh, types um, are something which must run uh, parallel to the uh, logical uh, process itself. There must be some sort of...